Natasha Files, Chief Minister. The Northern Territory Government is determined to tackle the alcohol-related harm we see in the Territory. No government has done more and we're committed to doing more into the future. Today I'm announcing that we will open expressions of interest for voluntary buyback of store-based liquor licences. These licences no longer exist. We have around 50 in our community and they were always designed to be ancillary to grocery items. So I've had licensees say to me that they would consider handing back their licence if there was monetary com compensation. So we're putting out a four-week expression of interest to test and see uh, if people do hand back their licences. We know that less liquor licences means less alcohol and e less alcohol-related harm in our community. I'm happy to take any questions. So this applies to the small corner shop. So the Northern Territory had the Riley Review, which was the most comprehensive review into alcohol-related policies and legislation. That identified we had a number of stores that were granted a licence as an ancillary to selling grocery items. They had morphed into pseudo-takeaway outlets, which was not their licence condition, so that is when we brought in the 25% cap. We have around 50 in the Territory, and what we're saying is if they wish to hand back in their store licence, a licence that no longer exists in terms of getting a new licence, that we will consider financial compensation, a reasonable amount, to reduce these licences in our community. So you've had canvassed some interest already? I've had licensees say to me that um, they would change their business model uh, and they'd be interested in handing back their licence voluntarily. So we're opening a four-week expression of interest uh, and then it will go through uh, some probity tests. We're not going to waste taxpayer dollars, uh, but this is an opportunity to reduce the number of licences in our community. Mm -hmm. Will those licences then just be scrapped or are you going to sell them? Like no, they will be scrapped. Let me be clear. You can no longer get a store licence. It is a historic licence. It is a licence that your trading conditions are 25% of your overall sales. Uh, so you can't get that licence uh, and this would reduce the number in our community. And there's still already apparently a moratorium on Correct. There is a moratorium in place uh, around takeaway licences. I don't think anyone can argue we need more alcohol outlets for takeaway grog in the Territory. How much are you taking this through the cost? As I just pointed out, uh, we're not going to be wasteful with taxpayer dollars, but it is an opportunity uh, to provide a small amount of financial compensation to remove those licences. We have around 50 of these store licences, so clearly if all 50 came forward, that would be considerable. Uh, but I expect that, you know, we may, we may get none that come forward, but I've had it raised with me that if there was a program in place, people would consider handing back their licence. Have you got a pool of money, at least, to give an idea of how much you're willing to do that? We did consider that, but uh, we clearly will take it on a case-by-case -case basis. We know the profit that is made. Uh, we know the volumes. They do vary um, depending on the size of that store. So we'll work through it in a, a respectful way, but it's an opportunity to remove these licences from our community and we often know that these licences cause harm in small communities, that they use alcohol sales to potentially prop up that business. That was not the way these licences were designed and it's not the way they should operate. Do you, do you think that the, these premises in particular are also allowing people to get around some of the alcohol restrictions the government has introduced? Let me be clear, if you are breaking your licence conditions, that is a breach and you will be held to account. We've already seen licensees uh, have to not trade, uh, to pay fines, so we have a risk-based licensing model. But this is off feedback from licensees who have said if there was a program in place, they would be interested in handing back their licences and having a different business model. This might just mean people go to the big shops to go and do their shopping for that. Could this disadvantage those smaller businesses who rely on those alcohol sales? No, we support small business, bigger businesses. This is an ancillary to sale of alcohol. It was never designed for them to be takeaway alcohol outlets. Uh, it's an opportunity for those licences to hand them back. What are these licensees saying to you when they're indicating that they would like their licence um, taken back? Are they at risk of alcohol business violence and that sort of thing? No, they're just saying we've got this um, liquor licence. Um, we think we can have a different business model going forward, but clearly that product has been built into part of our sales. Uh, so it's acknowledging that 25%. Uh, and so it's an opportunity for those licenses to be handed in. So there, and as I said, there is no more of these licenses. So there'll be less uh, licenses, which means less grog, which means less alcohol related harm in our community. Well, why won't you conduct a review of the bans in the register, particularly its impact on the safety of staff? 
So I have picked up on the commentary that uh, some people feel the BDR makes it unsafe for staff. That is not what industry tell me. Uh, I've had conversations, uh, people can refer, I'm sorry, the machine won't let you purchase, uh, and it actually uh, is a tool. So the BDR is simple, it is effective, it stops hundreds of people each day from accessing alcohol to then go on and horse, cause harm in our community. If it's effective, why since its introduction have the numbers when it comes to alcohol-related harm and alcohol-related hospital presentations consistently risen? We have seen alcohol-related harm grow in the Northern Territory and we are determined to tackle it. No government has done more introducing a floor price, risk-based licensing. There is not one individualised solution that will tackle these issues. The BDR is a small part of that, but an important part. And just in, in relation to what the industry is telling you, Declan Laverty's father, he gave some pretty specific examples of his son being abused and threatened on several occasions because he had been the one who was forced to reject service to a customer who wanted to buy alcohol. And you don't think that that is happening in a, in a more widespread manner? So I'm not commenting on the specifics. I don't want to prejudice any cases that are before police or the courts. But what I can say is the banned drinker register stops alcohol from going to those that have been banned because their behaviour when they drink is unacceptable and causes antisocial or criminal activity in our community. But it does lead to secondary supplies for other measures though, doesn't it? And that's what I say. Not one individualised solution tackles these issues. We know secondary supply is a pro problem. That is why police have been given additional resources to tackle secondary supply. That's why there was increased, quite significant, over $45,000 is the penalty for secondary supply in the Territory. There's a report done by Menzies a couple of years ago speaking to people um, from licensed premises who were also saying that as well as secondary supply, the BDR is seeing um, more property offences. The, the police are also talking about more property offences. You don't think it's worth looking at whether the BDR is contributing to a rise in property crime? We know the BDR is effective in stopping the sale of grog to people that cause harm in our community. It is simple, it's simple to use, and it stops people from getting that grog. Why didn't the government expand the bail laws to include offensive weapons, given we have seen incidents more recently and longer term involving rocks, cars, simple improvised weapons like that? So for Territorians to understand, any object can become an offensive weapon. Uh, a phone, a shoe, a rock, yes. What we have done is we uh, have started the work at looking at uh, the weapons, particularly around stamping out knife crime in our community. We're not saying we won't make further changes into the future, but we will look at it in a considered approach. But we found that anomaly, we acted quickly to make that change, uh, and we're not saying there won't be further work either around um, which weapons uh, sit in which category or the penalties that apply. When are those laws expected to come into effect? So my understanding is work is being undertaken today uh, so that that can be uh, gazetted, gazetted uh, and so uh, we certainly let uh, the Territorians and the media Is know when it's... I anticipate, anticipate yesterday, I was told, within a couple of days. As soon as we, we know, we'll let you know. Da sorry. Okay. Data from the Emergency Department in Alice Springs shows alcohol-related presentations have fallen since the alcohol bans were reinstated. Does that mean those alcohol bans are successful in reducing alcohol-related violence? So we have a number of measures that were brought in. We needed to provide immediate respite to our community. So I am pleased that ha that has been achieved. We now need to work through longer term based on both hospital, police, data, as well as feedback from the community, what needs to stay in place for the longer term. We have seen a considerable drop, uh, but we also need to look at year on year. And also what we often see with alcohol policies is a measure is brought in uh, and there's an initial um, spike in reduction, uh, but then that does ease. So we'll consider a number of factors. We've still got a few weeks before we make a decision that around whether that's extended. That data also shows that immediately after those alcohol bans in Aboriginal town camps were lifted following Ronald Finch's end, you, you see an immediate spike in both domestic violence related and alcohol related presentations at the Alice Springs Hospital and that continues at highly elevated levels for the next six months. Why did your government not intervene sooner to reinstate those bans? I pick up on the question it was us intervening, which acknowledges the Commonwealth walked away from this. Uh, they were the ones that failed to act. 
Uh, as I said, we started to see spikes, uh, but the information we received was particularly concerning through December uh, from Alice Springs Hospital, for example, as Health Minister, uh, and we certainly acted. It is a difficult space, alcohol policy. It is a legal product. We had a race-based policy in place, but I believe that we've worked forward uh, and we have strong laws, but they do allow Territorians to access what is a legal product, acknowledging the harm it causes. The proof that the federal and territory governments failed people by not having a proper transition out of stronger futures? It was the previous coalition government that turned its back on the territory. You know, we saw the intervention, we saw stronger futures, uh, they just walked away from that. But should, should you have, on July 17 last year, implemented the system that's in place now, where the bans remain and, and uh, communities can put together an alcohol management plan and have those bans lifted with that plans in place. Why didn't you do that on July 17 last year rather than the opt-in system you had? So when the Commonwealth failed in this space and uh, it was clear that they were putting nothing in place, we did act, we put in place a measure. Yes, we changed that measure, uh, but we certainly put in place measures. And as I said, alcohol is a difficult space because it is a legal product, uh, but it does cause so much harm in our community. Was, was the measure you put in place though, in hindsight, the wrong measure? We continue to be agile with alcohol policy. You always have to be. We've done an enormous amount of work. No government has done more to tackle these issues uh, and we will continue to do so. Um, you mentioned that uh, sort of alcohol-related presentation has fallen in Alice Springs since the alcohol bans were reinstated. What long-term measures are you putting in place to accompany that? Alcohol-related harm costs the Northern Territory community $2 billion a year, from police to our courts to our hospitals to lost producti productivity. Our community pays the price every single day. And no government has done more with a banned drinker register, risk-based licensing, a floor price. And we will continue to be agile. We will continue to listen to the community, but we will also work with industry because it is a legal product, but it does cause so much harm. Um, yesterday in Parliament, you mentioned uh, environmental design and some of the buildings where uh, security, basically there were security concerns. Um, can you talk a little bit more about why that's important? So buildings, workplaces across Australia and the world uh, have changed the way they lay them out, the measures that are put in place to keep staff safe. Uh, in terms of alcohol venues, uh, we have uh, provided um, in the past uh, alcohol secure, so measures that keep premises safe both after hours and during trading hours, and we're really keen to work with industry. Uh, some industry have uh, acknowledged this and have started making plans. Others have said we need some financial support to get that in place, but it's using structural physical alterations to keep staff safe, to stop product from being stolen and to keep customers safe. Can I just go back to the bail um, legislation you introduced yesterday? How is it going to make any difference if judges still have a lot of discretion? There was a case that Kezia Curie raised in Parliament last night where there was a, a teenage offender who several times had gone into bottle shops, had attacked staff and security guards with weapons including bottles and rocks and on every occasion that teenager was granted bail. Is there not a problem with how the judiciary is handling some of these matters, putting the rights of the victim or the rights of, of the offender ahead of the safety of the community? So yesterday we strengthened our laws to change the presumption of bail to send a strong message that knife crime is unacceptable and we will continue to work on other measures. Both police and the courts can decide bail, even if there is a neutral position or a presumption for bail. It is absolutely up to police and the courts. We have strong legislation that our courts follow and we respect the separation of power. There is a number of factors. Our judiciary work incredibly hard when they make these decisions, but absolutely, there are strong laws in the Northern Territory to keep the community safe, as well as the investment to stop the reoffending, because that's what we need to focus on. Do you think that is in line with community expectations though, when, when an offender like that, I mean there were three or four occasions where that offender threatened or attacked bottle shop staff and security guards with weapons including bottles and rocks and yet was given bail each time. Do you think that is in line with community expectations? It would be inappropriate for me to speak to that specific case, but what we are doing is working to make sure that we stop the risky behaviour that becomes criminal that we stop young people entering the child protection system, that when people offend, that there is programs, that there is support to stop that reoffending. Most Territorians realise that talking tough on crime doesn't stop crime. We have to put in place 
the evidence-based measures, and that is what we'll continue to do as a government. Do you, do you have Last an question, idea please. Of how many people these bail reforms will capture? What the scale of, of these changes are in the community? I'll have to seek advice and come back to you on that. Thank you very much.